just kind of how things go. How's everybody doing? Good. 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 I like it. Well, if you have a Bible, and I hope that you do, turn with me to Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. As we, uh, last couple weeks, we've been in, actually all summer, we've been in 1 John, and uh, we finished that up last week. Excited to get to hang out with you this morning. Um, have you ever found yourself in need of some good news? Amen. 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 That get people fired up. You know, it's uh, sometimes, and, and, for, and for various reasons, we might find ourselves just going through a difficult time. We found that life is just a bit too uh, stressful or strenuous. Maybe life's gone sideways, and we just need a little bit of good news. Well, when we talk about the gospel, we like to refer to it as good news. And, and that's for a good reason. The word gospel means good news, and it is the, the good news story of God from the beginning to eternity. And that is, that is God's good news story. And how in that, uh, he saw fit to send his only begotten son to go to the cross so that we might have everlasting life. And that is good news. And so instead of saying, um, have you ever need, were in need of some good news, we find ourselves with the question this morning, uh, who needs to hear the good news? Who needs to hear the good news? And that's the question that's there in front of us. And we have a tendency to kind of want to, want to answer that one out loud, just kind of blurt out the answer. But this morning, not a lot of slides, as in this is the only slide. Um, this is just the question that I want you to have in the back of your mind as we uh, make our way through, in, in my opinion, one of the neatest stories that we come across in the book of Acts. So to give a little bit of background, the book of Acts was written by a guy named Luke, the same Luke that wrote the gospel Luke. Um, we refer to his profession. He was a doctor. And so we like to call him Dr. Luke because he didn't have last name. Um, he, he wrote, and, and by writing the Gospel Luke and the, the book Acts, um, it's really part one and part two. Uh, it was, the, the, the Gospel Luke was written to a guy named Theophilus, and Luke was writing him to let him know about the story of Jesus and what had unfolded during Jesus' life. He then hits the book of Acts, and he writes this, another letter to Theophilus to explain what was happening in the early church. And so uh, Gospel Luke talking about the story of Jesus, the book of Acts talking about um, the life of the early church and how it wasn't just growing, it was exploding at crazy rates. And, and, and that's what he's writing about. And, and Acts is made up of a lot of different stories of good teachings, of just kind of giving us a history lesson of, of what's happening in the early church. We meet a lot of really cool figures, kind of New Testament heroes, um, and it is just, it's an incredible book. And we come to Acts chapter 10, we come across what's the biggest story in the book of Acts. Luke gives a lot of time to this story. And it actually runs from Acts chapter 10 all the way through verse 18 of Acts chapter 11. And it's a story between two guys. The first guy's named Cornelius and the second guy is named Peter. And yes, that Peter, the Peter. So this morning as we look through this, we're going to kind of toggle back and forth between what's going on in Cornelius' life, what's going on in Peter's life, and how these two intersect in a spectacular way while thinking about this question, who needs to hear the good news? Not just any good news, the good news. So I normally speak slow and smooth, but we have 60-something verses this morning, so I'm going to pick it up a little bit. I'm just messing. No, I'm not, really. I'm not messing. I, I'm, I'm being for real. So Acts chapter 10, verse 1 starts out with this. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort, which, which sounds like a mobster movie, if you're being honest. I mean, it's like intense. A devout man who feared God with all his household, gave alms generously to the people, and prayed continually to God. What a great description to have said of you. Cornelius, a devout man, who feared God, gave generously, prayed continually. Wouldn't you love for that to be said of you? At the, end of, at the end of your days, or just in the days in which you're currently living, to be known as a devout, fear, uh, a devout follower who fears the Lord, gives generously, prays continually. And that's what's said of, said of Cornelius. He is a centurion, which makes him a Gentile and not a Jew. So verse number three, it says, about the ninth hour of the day, which is about, um, which is about 3 p.m., 
he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God come in and say to him, Cornelius. And he stared at him in terror, which is what we would do. And said, what is it, Lord? And he said to him, your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa and bring one Simon who is called Peter. He is lodging with one Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had departed, he called two of his servants and a devout soldier from among those who attended him. And having related everything to, him, to them, he sent them to Joppa. So Cornelius, a devout, God-fearing man who gave generously, prayed continually, has a vision one day about 3 p.m. where an angel of God comes to him and says, listen, your alms and your prayers have come up as a memorial. You need to send a couple guys to Joppa and grab this guy named Simon, who is Peter, and bring him back to you. And the, the angel leaves and uh, he, he doesn't think about it. He doesn't ponder what's just been said. He calls two men, tells them everything that's happened, gives them their orders, attaches a soldier to them to make sure they could get there safely and return and sends them on their way. And thus begins the story. Then in verse number nine, we see that the next day we find out what Peter's doing. As they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour, which was noon to pray. He had become hungry and wanted something to eat. But while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance. I need to kind of hit the pause button here because what we're about to read, if you haven't read it before, is a really wild, crazy story. It's one of those kind of stories that people were to come to you and said, man, I got this vision from God and this is what he told me. You'd be like, I'm not sure we can be friends any longer <laughs> because I'm not sure what you're on. So this this Peter's up on the rooftop, which wasn't unusual. Roofs weren't, houses weren't built with roofs like we have now. They were all flat. They would get up there to kind of get some fresh air. He goes up there to pray, and he goes into a trance, and this is what he experiences. He saw the heavens opened, and something like a great sheet descend, being let down by its four corners upon the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air, and there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice came to him again a second time, What God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times, and the thing was taken up at once to heaven. Now, if you've read this story before, you've had people talk about this story before, but just imagine this being the dream that you see, or the, the, the vision that you experience while in a trance. Not a lot of detail, not a lot going on. You see a sheet come down from heaven. On it are all kinds of animals, and they're what the Jews would consider unclean animals. A voice from heaven says, hey, you, kill and eat. And Peter goes, uh-uh. No, I'm not going to do that. I am a good Jew. I have never eaten anything that was unclean or common. The voice comes back and says, no, 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 what I've made clean, don't call common. That happens three times, and then the sheet goes back up into heaven. And Peter goes, what in heaven just happened, right? And he begins to ponder what has taken place. Verse 17, now while P Peter was inwardly perplexed, no kidding, as to what the vision that he had seen might mean, behold, the men who were sent by Cornelius, having made inquiry for Simon's house, stood at the gate. And they called out to ask whether Peter, excuse me, whether Simon, who was called Peter, was lodging there. And while Peter was pondering the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you. Rise, go down, accompany them without hesitation, for I have sent them. So Peter's up there. He's kind of working through this vision that he's just seen, pondering what has happened, trying to figure out its meaning when the three guys show up from Caesarea. They knock at the door. They're like, hey, is Simon, who is Peter, here at the house of Simon the Tanner? And which I, I read that story. It's like, could it be less confusing? God, could you not have put him at Jeff's house? You know, one of those kind of things. I'm looking for Simon who's here at Jeff's house. No, it's like, no, I don't want that Simon. I want that Simon. And he's up there pondering. The men show up, and then the Spirit speaks to Peter, says, listen, three men from Joppa are here. They're here to get you. Don't wait. Don't hesitate to invite them in and go with them. And so Peter goes down. He opens the door. There they are. And he says, hey, why don't you come in for the evening tomorrow morning? We're going to take off and head out to Joppa. 
So he invited them, verse 23, in to be his guests. The next day he rose, went away with them, and some of the brothers from Joppa accompanied him. So he gets up the next morning. The three guys from Joppa go with him. Excuse me, the three guys from Caesarea go with him. But he also takes some of his friends with him. Which, you know, if somebody were to show up and say, hey, we need to go for a ride, you'd be like, great, I'm bringing somebody with me. You know, and back to the whole, and, and they're from the Italian mafia. Um, <laughs> Not just any mafia. So when you get when people take you for a ride in the mafia, you usually don't come back. And so they're like, "We're taking you to Joppa," and and the spirit said, "Hey, it's okay." Because if anybody ever if anybody showed up to your house and said, "Hey, God told me to come and get you," you'd be like, "Let me bring in some friends, just to have a discussion." Here's Officer Michael, and we're going to have a nice little conversation now. That's right. That's where you start calling every police officer friend you know, and some of you probably need more of them. Um, and, and so he, he goes with them because the Spirit said go with them, but he takes some guys with him from Joppa, which we find comes in very handy here in just a little bit. So he gets to town, and on the following day, they entered Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. And I love this. And, and don't you think you do the same? So imagine you one day, three o'clock in the afternoon, just kind of chilling. You go, you have all of a sudden have a vision from God. And the vision is, hey, go to the next town over, grab this guy. He believes in the same God that you do. You just need to bring him so he can talk to you about something that you don't know yet what he needs to talk to you about. And so you send guys over to get them and know that that guy's about to come back. You're calling everybody you know, right? Dude, y'all got to come check this one out. Because God said, this guy's going to come and talk to me. I'm just going to go ahead and get as many friends here as possible so we can all have this party together. And that's exactly what he does. Peter walks in and there is not just Cornelius but all of his buddies. Now, know this, is that they were in Joppa, which was a predominantly Jewish area, and they go to Caesarea, where the dominant people there are Gentiles. Community filled with people that aren't Jews. When Peter entered, verse 25, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet, and he worshiped him. Peter lifting him up, saying, stand up, I too am a man. Just a side note, we don't worship men, we worship the one true God. And him alone. And as he talked with them, he went in and found many persons gathered. So Peter's up on the, up on the rooftop, as, goes into the trance, has the vision. Um, the, trance, the, the trance goes away, the vision's done, and Peter's sitting there a little perplexed, right? There's a light bulb, it's just really dim. As he's pondering, the spirit comes to him and says, hey, three dudes from Joppa are about to show up and take you back to Joppa with them. Don't hesitate, go with them. The light bulb begins to get a little bit brighter. Peter gets to Joppa, walks into the room, into the house. It's not, just, uh, it's not just Cornelius. It's Cornelius and everybody he knows. And the light bulb gets even brighter. Peter says to them, verse number 28, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit anyone of another nation. Now, what kind of a Jew is Peter? Is he a good Jew or a bad Jew? He's a good Jew, right? Remember when the, during the vision, God says, hey, Peter, kill and eat. What's Peter's response? Never have I ever eaten anything that was unclean or common. And if you're going to lie to someone, who are you not going to lie to? Not going to lie to God. Peter believed he was talking to God. By making the statement, he would have known whether he was telling the truth or not. And I believe Peter was telling the truth. Never have I ever eaten anything that was unclean or common. God still said, listen, what I've made clean, you don't call common. So Peter, the good Jew, is standing before these Gentiles. And he says, listen, it is unlawful for me to hang out with you here. And, and, and the reason being makes sense. Now, it's not that Jews and Gentiles never interacted. It's that they were never to interact um, in, in certain types of spaces. And in someone's home was one of those places. Now, here in the South, when come, someone comes over to your house, what are you going to do a little bit of? You're going to eat, right? Somebody could stop by your house without you expecting them. They'd walk in and be like, would you like something to drink or to go through our refrigerator? I mean, you just, you're going to try to figure something out. Here's some fruit snacks. You know, you would, you would do something or interact because we like to fellowship around food. Well, that just didn't go well between Gentiles and Jews. Jews um, had to eat foods 
certain foods. They had to be prepared a certain way. Gentiles just weren't like that. And so to come together, just being in their presence would meant that you were being in the presence of something that was unclean. And these weren't things that were made up by humans. This was stuff that was established by God. But it was established by God for a reason and for a season. And so Peter walks in and he just acknowledges the fact, listen, y'all know that it's unlawful for me to be here. But then two of the coolest words in all of scripture, but God. Now, can I just, this is a little bit of free chicken. When, when you're reading through the Bible and you come across the words, but God, just pause for a little bit and try to figure out why they're there. Because they're always there for a really cool reason. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. Now, this is interesting. So think back to the vision. Peter goes into a trance, vision, sheet from heaven. On the sheet was what? Animals. What kind of animals? Unclean, common animals. So it would have made sense for Peter to stand before them and say, but God has shown me that I should not call any animal clean, common, or unclean. But that's not what he says. See, the light bulb's getting brighter. Peter knew that this wasn't just God saying you could eat whatever you want to eat. No, it was God telling him, listen, there is no such thing as an unclean or a common person. And so Peter says, listen, I shouldn't be here, but God said I needed to be here. And since God said I need to be here, I realized that God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without objection. I asked then why you sent for me. And the light bulb's pretty bright right now. And Cornelius responds, he says, four days ago about this hour, I was praying in my house at the ninth hour and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your alms have been remembered before God. Send therefore to Joppa and ask for Simon, who is called Peter. He is lodging in the house of Simon, a tanner by the sea. So I sent for you at once and you have been kind enough to come. Now, therefore, we are all here in the presence of God to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. And the light bulb is full on bright. And Peter goes, oh, that's why I'm here. And this is what Peter does. So Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly I understand that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with fire. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third dead and made him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who have been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us. Go back to verse 33. Cornelius says, I sent for you at once and you have been kind enough to come. Now, therefore, we are all here in the presence of God to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. This is what he was commanded to do. Verse 42, and he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him, all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. And that's a sermon. Peter preached because he'd been commanded by God to preach that Jesus saves. He just didn't know who all he was supposed to preach it to. And his, the blinders are off. His eyes are clear. And he knows this isn't just a message for the Jews. This is a message for the nations. And what's really cool is I think to those dudes that came with him from, from Joppa, the Jews that had probably heard this sermon before, my guess is this was one of Peter's power sermons. He would preached this one once or twice. He'd stood before people a couple times and threw down this one. 
There are a couple of times to where he unpacked what Jesus came to do. Because he'd been commanded by Jesus, and not just commanded by Jesus word of mouth, he'd been commanded by Jesus face to face. And Peter preaches, and all the dudes from Joppa are going, yeah, amen, but who's going to respond because all these people are Gentiles? Well, somebody responded. While Peter was still saying these things, this is like one of those times where people don't even wait for the invitation, they just get up and go, which we'd have a difficult time here. The Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word, and the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. And so you see these guys from Joppa go, what is going on? These guys can't get saved. They can't get the Holy Spirit like we have, but they clearly have the Holy Spirit. And they are on Fire. And so you had the circumcised guys that came with, came with Peter from Joppa going, holy moly, what's going on? You had the Gentiles, they just getting excited, jumping over pews, filled with the Spirit. For they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter declared, can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to remain for some days, because they wanted to talk with him a little bit further. And they had a party. But this is an isolated event. And I believe this is why, this is just, this is kind of the appetizer to the real story. Because the story doesn't end here. See, if it had, in, if it had ended here, it could, somebody could have just written it off as, well, this is just a one-time kind of thing. Even though Peter made some very intense declarations. They could have just said, listen, this was just, a, this was just an isolated incident. But when Gentiles who aren't supposed to get the Holy Spirit start getting the Holy Spirit, you think you're going to be able to keep that to yourself? No, word began to spread. And word spread in a way um, a little bit different than it does today. You know, today we, we spread things via Twitter and Facebook. And some of you, bless your hearts, you let everybody know everything going on in your life. And you let... You, you let it know when it's happening and where it's happening. You do things like I'm at McDonald's eating a salad, which is interesting. And you take pictures of it. You take a picture of the salad. And you take a picture of you with the salad so people know it was you eating that salad and not just someone else's salad that you took the picture of. And then you, then you drop a pin letting everybody know where you were, which McDonald's you were when you ate that salad, just in the event that someone within the next three minutes wants to come by and view this crazy anomaly. And that's how we go through life. We just let everybody know. And it's easy to know what's going on the other side of the planet. But that's not how things were. You didn't, you didn't tweet something. You didn't Facebook something. It's not really a good adjective for that one. Um, you, you didn't just put something on Snapchat. You didn't do things like that. But this was such a wild event that word begins to spread. And when word begins to spread, it doesn't always go to the places you'd probably prefer it to spread to first. Because in verse number one, this is, where, this is where kind of the main point of this whole thing comes to a head. Because in verse one, now the apostles and the brothers who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. And everybody said, uh-oh. Because now the Jews that weren't there to observe something, now heard that Gentiles were speaking in tongues and receiving the word of God. And this was going to be problematic. And so in verse number two, Peter went up to Jerusalem. And when he did, the circumcision parties criticized him saying, you went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. And Peter kind of has that crisis of belief, belief moment. He can be a truth teller, or he can be a backpedaler. And Peter, back in the day, might have been a backpedaler. But Peter here is a truth teller. That's right. And so Peter does what Peter likes to do. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, he was criticized. In verse 4, but Peter began and explained it to them in order. So he unpacks the whole story. They said, how could you eat with the unclean people? And Peter goes, well, let me tell you a story. 
And he tells him this story. He says, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision, something like a great sheet descending, being let down from heaven by its four corners, and it came down to me. Looking at it closely, I observed animals and beasts of, and, of prey and reptiles and birds of the air. And I heard a voice saying to me, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But I said, by no means, Lord, for nothing common or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But the voice answered a second time from heaven, what God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times and all was drawn up again into heaven. And when Peter says this, understand this is Peter that's talking. See, if, we, if somebody were to walk up to me and go, no, 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 the reason why I believe this now is because of this. Here's the vision I saw yesterday. We look at him and go, man, you're nuttier than a fruitcake. But what happens here is Peter says, no, listen, I had a vision, and this was the vision I saw, and everybody there would have been like, yeah, Peter's known for having these. It's not unusual for Peter to get these kind of messages and clear direction from God. Because once again, Peter didn't just receive these commands word of mouth. He, re he received these commands face to face. And so when Peter said, God did this and I saw this, everybody would have been like, yeah, this is Peter talking. Makes sense to me. It says, verse number, um, verse number 11, and behold, at that very moment, three men arrived in the house, which we in, in, in which we were, sent to me from Caesarea. And the Spirit told me to go with them, making no distinction. These six brothers also accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. Brilliant. When Peter left Joppa, who did he take with him? Not just the three guys that came to get him. He took some friends with him. They were the ones that saw this incredible thing happen in Caesarea. And when Peter went to Jerusalem, he went ahead and took them with him as well. And so these six guys who have seen Jesus do Seen, excuse me, seen people experience Jesus in incredible ways. They were there. They entered the house, verse 13, and he told us how he had seen the angel stand in his house and say, send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will declare to you a message by which you will be saved, you and all your household. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them, just as on us at the beginning. Now, we can't run past this too quickly because this is important. Peter and his Jewish buddies were saved the same exact way that these Gentiles were. God has been saving the same way since the beginning. People weren't saved one way back in the Old Testament and saved a different way now. It has all been that we have been saved by the grace of God. And you are in need of God's grace in order to be saved. And Peter says here, listen, that Holy Spirit fell on them just as on us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave the same gift to them as he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? <laughs> and silence coursed over the crowd. I mean, it was a modern day mic drop. Peter said, listen, I observed them saved the same way I was saved. I saw them filled with the Spirit the same way I was filled with the Spirit. Then I remembered back to those great words of Jesus and what he said. And then I realized that if God wanted to save them, that was his prerogative. Who am I to stand in his way? Because here's what I know. There are a lot of things I don't know. There are a lot of things I'm kind of a little fuzzy on. But here's one thing I do know. There is a God and it's not me. And that's what Peter says. There's a God and it's not me. Who am I to stand in his way? And a silence covered the crowd. And it was deafening. When they heard these things, they fell silent. And they glorified God saying, then to the Gentiles also, God has granted repentance that leads to life. Church, I'm here to tell you, today at Edgewood, we declare, then to the nations, God has provided the way. 
Who needs to hear the good news? Everyone needs to hear. But can I pick at you with a question just for a moment? See, this is a church answer. It's, it, we see this one and go, hey, everybody needs to hear. Can I challenge you today to ask yourself this question? Ask yourself, who am I reluctant to share the good news with? Who am I reluctant to share this good news with? If I believe everyone needs to hear, who deep down in my heart would I rather not share this good news? And that could be driven by all different kinds of reasons. It could be racially motivated. It could be economically motivated. It could be gender motivated. It could be nation motivated. It could be location motivated. It could be this person wronged me motivated. But I'm here to tell you this morning that we don't get to decide who needs to hear because we've already been told who needs to hear. What I need to ask myself is, who am I that I'm going to stand in God's way? Because I don't want to stand in God's way. I want to walk in God's way. In God's way is go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that Jesus has commanded us. Knowing that as we do that, we do that with Jesus by our side. Who are you reluctant to share the good news with? And my prayer this morning is that we will fall on our face before a holy God. We will repent of that sin. And then we will take the good news to the ends of the earth. Which for most of us means talking to somebody in our house or walking across the street. It's the greatest news we could ever share. Will you join me in sharing it with the world? for the glory of God.